and gentlemen. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, hoping that we will find you all well and in good mood during these challenging times of COVID-19. With the pandemic still holding sway over our private and business lives, um, the new normal, though often referred to lately, is still a concept in flow and a trip into the yet unknown with quite a number of potential pitfalls lying ahead. Low cash flow, high receivables, potential liability exposures, changing safety regulations and notification obligations are some of the major issues that might challenge your corporate governance during and beyond the crisis and our main focus today. It will be our pleasure to have our valued colleagues Markus Schlüter for Indonesia, Marian Meyer for the Philippines and Paul Weingarten for Singapore on board as expert speakers today. Unfortunately, our colleague Martin Kometska, who was scheduled to shed a light on the specific circumstances in Thailand, will not be able to join us today due to some unpredictable but urgent personal matters. Should you have any questions relating to Thailand that you intended to ask during the session, please do not hesitate to let me know via, either via the chat function or via email. We will make sure that this will be answered independently. As to the schedule of this session, we will proceed country by country in alphabetical order. And after each country's session, you will have the opportunity to uh, submit your individual questions via the chat option, and the colleague in charge will answer these subsequently. Um, please note that this webinar will be recorded to uh, be made available online for you or your colleague, colleagues to recap any time you wish later on. So, looking forward to a most enlightening session, it is now my pleasure to leave the stage to Markus Rüter. Thank you very much, Bettina, uh, for this nice introduction. Yeah, it's my pleasure to talk to you uh, about Indonesia today. Yeah, as said already, unfortunately, we do not have Thailand included today. But uh, if you have any questions, please uh, let us know. And we can subsequently, by email or phone, also discuss these, of course. Anyway, I hope you will not leave us now because uh, we also have a lot to tell you about the other three jurisdictions and uh, I trust uh, that you will have an interesting time in this webinar. Talking about Indonesia, the country is taking significant steps towards improving corporate governance. The lessons learned from the Asian financial crisis of 1997 and AI 98 and also the global financial crisis of 2008 were critical in initiating these reforms. The reforms were articulated in the Indonesian Corporate Governance, Governance Roadmap, which was launched in early 2014 by the Indonesia Financial Services Authority uh, with support of the World Bank's International Finance Corporation. The roadmap broadly seeks to achieve a strengthened, strengthened supervisory role of company boards, improved quality of disclosure by companies, or in other words, increased company transparency, and uh, also, of course, greater protection for shareholders. Ah, oh, Bettina, you can give me the next slide, please. Yeah, thank you very much. There are several recommendations in the roadmap, which includes, uh, among several others, the protection of shareholders. This shall be achieved through transparent preparation, organization, and disclosure of results of the general meetings of shareholders, and uh, also clearly defined dividend and voting rights. Then the role of stakeholders, such as employees, vendors, and others, especially in the implementation of anti-corruption and procurement policies is also governed. Long-term incentives for employees uh, are listed in the recommendations. This also includes the implementation of a whistleblower policy, which in practice uh, so far seems not significantly advanced in Indonesia though. An important recommendation which found its way into legislation recently is the disclosure of ultimate ownership and disclosure of independence criteria for commissioners. 
The role of the board shall be more transparent, for example, in the nomination and remuneration process of commissioners and directors. This also includes ensuring disclosure of qualifications of board members and providing orientation programs for board members on their fiduciary duties. The role of the board should also extend to the tenure of commissioners, promotion of board diversity, the evaluation of the board performance, and also the implementation of succession planning policies. So under the roadmap, these recommendations should already have been implemented by June 2015. However, until now, the roadmap has only partially been implemented for some types of companies under the Financial Services Authority. But they serve as a helpful guideline for foreign investors in Indonesia to ensure corporate compliance and should thus be considered uh, by anyone already. The general legal framework for corporate governance in Indonesia can be a bit confusing. Uh, this may be attributed to the relatively young state of corporate governance in Indonesia. There have been significant improvements over the past five to seven years, although there's still much scope for greater clarification and consistency in the legal and regulatory framework, as well as improved implementation and the adherence by companies. There is so far no single consolidate, consolidated legislation or regulation covering the corporate governance field. Furthermore, there is yet no single regulatory body responsible for enforcing corporate governance. However, all Indonesian companies must comply with the corporate governance provisions prescribed in their articles of association, of course, and also set out in the corporate law, which is law number 40, uh, entered into force in 2007 on limited liability companies. Companies must also comply with other laws and regulations governing the specific industry and activities in which they are engaged in. Uh, these laws and regulations can also include corporate governance provisions. So let's see which corporate entities are eligible for foreign investment and how they are structured. A limited liability company uh, is abbreviated PT in Indonesia. <clears throat> it stands for Cruzan Terbatas, which is a company with uh, limitation. Uh, you might have seen it uh, if you're not anyway active in Indonesia. There's always uh, the letters PT in front of the actual corporate name, which uh, compares to, for example, the German GmbH or LLC in many jurisdictions. <clears throat> Such company is actually the only corporate entity which is permitted for foreign investment in Indonesia. A PT must have at least two shareholders as well as a signed deed of establishment that is execu uh, executed before a notary public and includes the company's articles of association. Once the deed of establishment is approved by the Minister of Law and Human Rights, the PT gains status as a legal entity with limited liability. A PT that is wholly or partially foreign owned is categorized as a foreign investment company uh, and has the additional abbreviation PMA. It stands for Pnanaman Modal Asing and simply indicates that there's foreign shareholding in the company. These companies are regulated by the Indonesia Investment Coordinating Board, which is uh, in short referred to as BKPM. And the key regulations applicable to investment companies are particularly the investment law number 25, which is also uh, has been enacted in 2007, as well as uh, some BKPM, re BKPM regulations on guidelines and procure procedure procedures for investment licensing and facilities. PMA companies must implement corporate, social, and environmental responsibility initiatives under the law 25 on capital investment. Non-compliance can result in a warning letter or also limitations on business activities and uh, potentially in order to cease business activities for investment facilities up to, which would be the Altima ratio, revocation of business or investment license. Uh, Bettina, can you give me the next slide, please? 
So let's have a look at the mandatory board composition and restrictions in Indonesia. An unlisted company must have the following management structure, which is a general meeting of shareholders, an organ which you know in most of the company, uh, most of the countries worldwide. Then we have a board of commissioners, uh, the supervisory organ, and of directors. The authority of the general meeting of shareholders is defined by the company law, but also in the articles of association of the company, or in both. As such, the general meeting of shareholders uh, nominates and approves membership of the board of commissioners and board of directors. It approves the annual report and financial statements. It also approves the distribution of profits and losses, including the payment of dividends. Further, the amendments to the articles of association or reorganization, including amendments to the company's authorized capital and, of course, dissolution. And finally, it's uh, also approving extraordinary transactions, for example, borrowing or lending money above certain amounts, encumbering company assets, and so on. The company law further adopts a two-tier board structure. As mentioned, we have the Board of Commissioners, which has a supervisory function. Uh, unlike in some other jurisdictions, this is a mandatory board in Indonesia and cannot be waived. The Board of Directors has managerial or day-to-day -day operational responsibilities. The boards have equal status, notwithstanding their different functions. The purpose of the two board structure is to enhance checks and balances. So the board of directors manages the day-to-day -day operations of the company. It is accountable to the general meeting of shareholders and its work is supervised or overseen by the board of commissioners. The company law and the company's articles of association regulate the authority of the board of directors and the election and dismissal of its members. Generally, a PT must have at least one director and one commissioner and there is no limit to the maximum number of directors and commissioners in the respective boards. Members of the boards uh, are nominated and appointed as well as discharged uh, and dismissed by the general meeting of shareholders. There is no restriction on the term of appointment for directors or commissioners uh, of such PT companies. Since there are no nationality restrictions under the company law, companies can appoint foreigners to the board of directors or commissioners subject to certain conditions. For example, there should be no available Indonesian nationals with the requisite technical knowledge uh, and skills for the role. However, the articles of association of a company may stipulate a nationality restriction for the board of directors or commissioners. That is, only Indonesian nationals could be appointed as board members. But this is in practice rarely done by foreign investors to maintain flexibility regarding the board member nationalities. This said, although PT PMAs have no nationality restrictions regarding members to be on their board of directors, there's an exception with regard to the human resources director position, which by law is reserved for Indonesian nationals. This has a very high relevance in practice. Foreigners are not permitted to sign any employment-related documentation and must issue a respective POA to local staff. Notably, non-executive directors are not recognized in Indonesia. All directors appointed by the general meeting of shareholders are considered executives with the authority to act on behalf of and in the best interest of the company. In principle, a person cannot be appointed as a member of the board of directors and the board of commissioners simultaneously. This would mostly create a conflict of interest situation because the duty of the BOC is, as discussed, to supervise the board of directors. And in such a function, a member would then supervise his own activities, which of course would uh, lead to compliance problems. Let's say a few words to the director's remuneration, as this is also often discussed by our clients. 
Indonesian law does not require directors or commissioners of a company to be employees of such company. The remuneration <coughs> of directors is determined by the general meeting of shareholders and the shareholders have the right to inspect respective director service contracts. The BOD must disclose the director's remuneration for the previous financial year in the company's annual report. This report must then be presented to the annual general meeting of shareholders for approval. So what are the director's powers? Usually a company's articles of association detail internal uh, management rules and authority. As said, the BOD is the company's executive arm. Generally, it can exercise all the powers of the company unless determined otherwise under the law or the articles or uh, general meeting of the shareholders. So the power of directors can, of course, be restricted. The company law requires the board of directors to obtain the general meeting of shareholders approval for certain actions, which are listed here on the slides. So notably to transfer or encumber company assets with a certain value, change of capitalization, amendment uh, of the articles, of course, or other corporate actions that affect the existence or essential structure of the company. Unless the general meeting of shareholders determines otherwise, <coughs> the board of directors may delegate responsibility for specific issues to individual directors uh, or a certain gremium, which means they can determine the allocation of its duties and authorities among its members through a board resolution. Under a power of attorney, the board of directors can assign one or more of the company's employees or any third party to undertake certain legal actions for and on behalf of the company. Uh, Bettina could have the next slide, please. Thank you very much. The board of directors' uh, primary general duty is set out in the company law, meaning to carry out day-to-day -day operations and of course to represent the company inside and outside the court. The company law sets out certain specific duties of the BOD, including the duty to submit annual work plans to the board of commissioners or general meeting of shareholders and uh, annual reports to the shareholders after consideration by the commissioners. The law requires members of the board of commissioners uh, and directors to perform their duties in good faith prudently and responsibly in the interests of the company and in accordance with its purposes and objectives. This, of course, is a requirement we see in many countries, but in Indonesia, in practice, it's uh, seen quite tightly. Each member of the board of commissioners or directors who is at fault or negligent in performing his or her duties is personally liable for any of the resulting losses to the company. However, a director or commissioner is not liable for the company's losses or bankruptcy if he can prove that the losses or bankruptcy are not attributable to his fault or negligence. He or she managed the company in good faith, prudently and responsibly in the said interest of the company and in accordance with the company's purposes and objectives. He or she had no personal interest, either directly or indirectly, in the actions causing the losses or bankruptcy. He has now taken action to prevent the occurrence or continuation of the losses or the bankruptcy. And of course, they also specific provisions for criminal actions such as theft, fraud, and bribery that can apply to directors in the Indonesian Penal Code. Accordingly, criminal sanctions for theft, fraud, or bribery are as follows. Theft uh, would be sanctioned with imprisonment for between five and 20 years or a fine. Fraud with imprisonment for between one and four years or also a fine. And bribery with imprisonment for between one year and sometimes even life sentence in certain grave circumstances. Even capital punishment is possible, but uh, I have not seen any cases where this happened. 
Assuming that these criminal actions will not occur in your operations, of course, uh, let's take a closer look at the practically relevant scope of a director's duties and liability under the bankruptcy and insolvency regulations in Indonesia, which especially at these times can have quite practical relevance uh, for your companies. There is a law number 37 of 2004 on bankruptcy and suspension of debt payment obligations, which, however, does not specifically provide the scope of duties and liability relating to bankruptcy or suspension of debt payment obligation proceedings. But the company law provides that where a bankruptcy occurs due to fault or negligence of the board of directors, and the company's assets are not sufficient to pay all of the company's obligations, each member of the board of directors is jointly and severally liable for all obligations that remain unpaid by the bankruptcy estate. This personal liability applies also to the board members who were at fault or negligent and who served on the board of directors in the five-year period before the declaration of bankruptcy. Hence, subject to discretion of the authorities, there might be a chance that there is a certain priority of liability. For example, those directors or commissioners with direct fault will, or would be held liable first. However, by law, all members are deemed to have knowledge of what is happening inside the company. So it is not guaranteed that such a priority will be given. As discussed, the board of directors is responsible for the management, should be in good faith and full responsibility. So the relationship between the BOD and shareholders is based on confidence and trust, and thus is seen as a fiduciary duty of the BOD to take care of the company. This is the background for such full and personal liability from Indonesian point of view for a company's losses in cases of fault or negligence in carrying out the duties. In this respect, members of the board of directors cannot be held liable for the losses if they can prove that the losses are not due to their fault or negligence, or they perform the management in good faith and with prudence in the interests of the company. They have not caused direct or indirect conflict of interest in the action of management that causes the loss, or they have taken proper action to prevent the losses from arising or continuing. Members of the BOD can be held jointly and severally liable in other events too, pursuant to the company law. In case of repurchase of issued shares by the company, the BOD would be jointly liable for losses suffered by shareholders in good faith, incurred as a result of repurchases which are void by operation of law. In the event that the financial report of a company is inaccurate or, for example, misleading, the members of the board are also jointly liable to the affected parties in case their fault is proven. In case of a disbursement of an interim dividend, which happens in practice from time to time, in Indonesia, the BOD is jointly responsible for company's losses in the event that the shareholders do not return the interim dividend if after the financial year ends, it turns out that the company has suffered losses. Legal actions performed for and on behalf of the company by a member of the board of directors after the appointment has been annulled uh, and void and would also become personal liabilities of such ex-BOD member. Further, in the event of a liquidation, the company may not perform legal actions unless they are done for settlement in relation to the liquidation. So legal actions performed by the company which are in compliance to this purpose can trigger joint liability of the company, BOD and BOC altogether. Given these significant liability risks, the question of course comes up whether directors liability may be restricted or limited to a certain extent. The company law itself is silent on whether the company can indemnify a director or commissioner against liability, but this issue can be addressed in the articles of association of the company, of course. However, in practice, it is not so common so far in Indonesia for a company 
to indemnify directors or commissioners. We have seen many cases where internal disputes came up and this was refused. The general meeting of shareholders can resolve to discharge the board of commissioners or directors from liability to the company to the extent that these matters are disclosed in the company's annual report. This discharge then has internal effect but does not release the commissioners or directors from liability to the third parties. There's also no statutory requirement or even common practice um, for a director to take out um, insurance against personal liability. To my knowledge so far, some directors and commissioners of large public companies in Indonesia obtain insurance against personal liability and then their companies pay these premiums, but this so far is rarely seen in PMA, probably due to cost reasons. So in conclusion, board members should take care of a proper documentation that they as diligently fulfill their duties in order to reduce risks which in Indonesia appear somewhat higher than in some other jurisdictions uh, of the region. Normally, especially if no intent or gross negligence has occurred, PMAs discharge the directors annually to minimize at least the risks concerning internal claims, which to me would seem a fair approach. This is it uh, for Indonesia. I hope I stayed, yeah, mostly within the time. I saw that some questions were coming in in the Q&A already. Um, I will pick some and try to briefly respond uh, in order not to fully extend the time. All questions that we will not address within the sessions will not be lost, don't worry. We will pick them up all and individually respond to you after the session, of course. So feel free to also address your Q and uh, your questions, although we might not take them uh, due to time reasons within the session. So what do I see here? Ah, yeah, this is of course, if a director holds only a nominee position, will this limit the liabilities in case of a bankruptcy or other company losses? Uh, no, unfortunately not. As said, by law, all members are deemed knowledge of what is happening inside the company. So in case they would internally merely be seen as an interim nominee, director or commissioner for whatever internal reasons, um, this would be a concept that is not recognized by Indonesian corporate law. This would actually not constitute a reason to avoid responsibility on their duties. It would um, therefore need to be evidence that uh, such directors were without knowledge of the misconduct of the predecessors, which in practice can turn out quite difficult. Here's one question which refers to shareholder rights. This might also be interesting for some of you. What action can a minority shareholder take if it believes the company is being mismanaged and what level of sharing is required to do this? Um, yeah, that's a good one. Of course, if you are in a joint venture with minority shareholding, then this question often is of high relevance. Um, if a minority shareholder finds that a company action is damaging uh, certain interests, then they can require the company to purchase their shares at a fair price, for example, by way of appraisal. Otherwise, uh, minority shareholders uh, representing at least 10% uh, of the total shares with valid voting rights uh, can take derivative action on behalf of the company against the company's directors or commissioners. If those directors or commissioners um, have acted unlawfully and to the detriment of the shareholders and third parties. Okay, I think we leave it with a and a for this. Um, it is now my pleasure to shift uh, over to my colleague, Dr. Marian Meyer in the Philippines, who will uh, elaborate on uh, the legal framework and uh, aspects in the Philippines. Marian, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Marcus. Guten Morgen nach Deutschland. 
Good afternoon to the attendees in this part of the world, Mabuhay. Um, after we've heard about uh, Indonesia, compliance in Indonesia, I have the honor to present on the Philippines. Compared to Indonesia, I will open the focus uh, of the presentation on compliance a little bit more and um, will focus more on the general environments that we currently have here in the Philippines that impacts uh, not only compliance, but uh, impact eventually your or the companies in general here in the Philippines also with regards to their business operations. So that will be the first part. We will talk a little bit about uh, the responsibilities of the board of directors as well. And then also specific uh, compliance risks um, that companies uh, face in general in the Philippines and uh, some measures that might be taken. There's many, many areas uh, that we could uh, talk about. So if it's uh, compliance in uh, Labor matters, for example, is of course a big topic at the moment, but I will focus a bit more on the regulatory part because we will see later um, why uh, this is uh, quite a big topic uh, nowadays. As the Philippines, what we will see in a minute, is still um, on the way out of its various levels of quarantine measures to a new normal and to getting used um, to the New York normal and the new regulations that are already in place or will be in place. So Bettina, can you go to the next slide, please? So what I want to show you here is, uh, as I mentioned, an idea about uh, the Philippines um, way through the coronavirus uh, crisis. Um, compared to other countries, for example, if we look uh, to Germany, some European countries, uh, also within Asia, maybe, maybe Singapore, we're actually still in uh, the economic centers of the Philippines, primarily still in a lockdown situation or in a quarantine uh, status. And what I sh uh, am showing here you on this slide is uh, the various levels that we went through or still are going through and the consequences. And all these consequences, of course, have also an impact on the compliance or also on your operational situation. You might have heard about the Philippines with regards to coronavirus uh, very early when uh, it was in February. The Philippines was the first country where a person passed away um, due to coronavirus uh, outside of China. It was actually a tourist who flew to the Philippines from China and passed away, or actually from Wuhan, even from Wuhan, and passed away here in the Philippines. Nonetheless, from the very beginning, um, as you will see here, or you can see in the first row, uh, the numbers were relatively low or small. So we had a few cases, five cases, two, three cases a day at the very uh, beginning. Um, the Philippines was relatively slow compared to many Asian countries with regards to uh, closing down the countries for international flights. It was, on the other hand, um, one of the countries that uh, had the first or amongst the first with a strict uh, lockdown situation. So it started actually in on 9th of March, March when the government declared a, pub, a state of public health emergency. At that time, there were 50 confirmed cases in the Philippines and the state of public health emergency basically uh, started with uh, the obligation for social distancing. There were, was the possibility for localized zones where there could be a strict lockdown, businesses were still open, government offices were still open, but then within a very short period of time, actually within a week's time, uh, the situation changed completely. And the story behind this is actually that uh, President Duterte declared a state of public health emergency. And then he saw that the notorious uh, traffic in Metro Manila um, was not uh, reduced at all, even though he uh, urged the people to stay at home if they cancel. So actually within a day or within a short period of time, he declared the ECQ, which is the Enhanced Community Quarantine, which was basically a lockdown of Metro Manila and parts of Luzon, later also other parts of uh, the Philippines followed. Um, at that point of time, 110 cases. Um, the 
lockdown meant it that people had or uh, was an order to 100% stay at home. So offices were closed, only essential businesses were allowed to operate and people had either no work if the offices closed entirely or a significant part started to operate then from their home offices. Under ECQ people are or were not allowed to leave the houses uh, except for essential business and essential business was actually only to go out for food and if medical supplies is needed. There were different levels throughout the Philippines. The most extreme was that certain parts, certain barangays, uh, you couldn't even leave the house at all. That means the barangay actually delivered food to the doorsteps of the people. Public transport was stopped immediately. That was a problem in the Philippines because the president declared the uh, enhanced community quarantine. Public transport came to a halt. So I mentioned earlier, he was upset that the Manila traffic was still around. Suddenly there was no more traffic. Metro Manila was like a ghost town. But on the other side, uh, the government hasn't realized at that time that that would also hit the essential workers. So that would also hit the nurses, the doctors, which in the first days had difficulties actually to go even to the um, workplaces. So that's what we dealt with for quite uh, some time until um, 16 May, um, when the Philippines then slowly started its um, path to open up with a modified enhanced community quarantine. At that point in time, there were about 12,305 cases. Still, the 100% stay at home applied. Still, no public tra transport, no domestic travel. Um, no international travel and businesses. Uh, the only difference was we're opening up slowly. So more and more industries were added to those essential businesses for slowly or gradually opening up the economy. Next step of the quarantine measures is the general community quarantine, which we have since June. Basically, since June, it started to be a bit more diversified in um, the Philippines or particularly in Luzon. Before, most were under ECQ, a modified community quarantine and so on. Since 1st of June, it really depends significantly on the cases in the specific area declared by the task force, the government task force to fight uh, the COVID virus. And the task force declares every level of quarantine that you will see which a certain area will be under so there are even nowadays there are uh, parts or cities which are still under the ecq under the strictest form of quarantine there's some which are under modified some under general but we have also some parts particularly in the provinces which have no quarantine measures at all since first of june that's basically when the economy started to open up more 18,638 cases at that point in time. Um, people actually were still urged to stay at home and stayed mostly at home. One reason is fear of the COVID crisis, uh, of the COVID virus. Number two is still no public transport. So it was difficult for people to go anywhere, also to work. So even though businesses were allowed to open also, up to 50% of their usual capacity in the office. Um, we will see if we go here in Metro Manila into the office buildings, they are still to a significant part empty because again, people stay at home for health reasons. And again, transport is a challenge. Also government offices started to open up or should be fully operational, but practically that's not really the case. What we currently see and during general community quarantine is that they are opening then they have a COVID case then they might from one day to the other close for a few days or for entire week so it's a little bit a lottery and that's also coming back later to compliance issues that when you have to file their deadlines when you have uh, when you have to file documents that when you have deadlines uh, and suddenly the government office is closed and there's also no clear regulation about what will happen in this case um, one reason, try to file as early as possible to deal with this situation. Um, as I mentioned, these are the different phases uh, where we'll be going to. Metro Manila was actually for 1st of July 
scheduled to go down to the modified general community quarantine, but due to a large number of cases, um, Metro Manila sick in the general community quarantine. The second biggest city in the Philippines, Cebu City, actually is currently pretty bad hit. Um, so in June, or I think even earlier, they were put under back or never really came out of the enhanced community quarantine. Bettina, can you go to the next slide? Correct. So what we see here is actually at the time at 5 p.m., the Philippine Ministry of Health will publish the current um, cases in the country, the official cases. And what you see here is that as of uh, yesterday, 5 p.m., the Philippines has 47,873 cases. So it's quite interesting that we had a strict uh, quarantine measures with 110 cases. Now we're at 47 thousand cases in total and per day we added uh, yesterday 1540 sig significant more than at the very beginning still the philippine economy is gradually opening up the reason is basically because uh, the government has not really much options financially is one reason second you have to consider in the philippines significant part of the people uh, do not really earn a uh, large amount for the living if the offices are closed due to a strict lockdown, the rule of no, um, no work, no pay normally applies. And then it gets really, really difficult for those people to make a living or basically get food between their teeth. Let's go to the next topic. So this is just about the general environment in fir uh, first, Bianca and Bettina. Next slide, please. So let's... We saw the environment in general and the environment which makes it difficult for companies to operate and also therefore when they operate to um, stay in compliance with the regulatory obligations. Therefore, the next question is if you're a director or in general, if there is a liability of the company, how might there be, uh, might there be eventually a liability of the directors itself? So liability of directors in the Philippines, the board of, well, let's talk first about the board of directors. The board of directors exercises the corporate powers of the corporation and manages all its business in accordance with the corporation's code of the Philippines. That's actually basically the same as what you know from most countries. Um, the core responsibilities are act on behalf of the corporation. And then that's one of the crucial points the board of directors efficient, effectively monitors the management's performance to ensure companies' compliance with applicable laws and best business practice. So when we translate this and ask ourselves, so where does um, the personal liability of board members start and where does it end? It can be said, if you look at the right side of the slide, Board members are in the Philippines generally not personally liable when they act in good faith on behalf of the corporation. I would say, having heard about the Philippines, that the risk of liability, um, having heard about Indonesia, the risk of liability here in the Philippines might be maybe less. So, in general, there is a presumption that there is no liability unless that the board members acted unlawfully, uh, willfully, unlawfully, acted cross negligently or acted in bad faith, and the case which is actually invoked or in practice uh, more often than all the other cases, it actually acts or she acts in conflict of the interests. I added the provision of the cooperation code, section 30, which lays out the principles again. Um, as I mentioned, we do not see or will, I'm not aware of many cases with regards to civil personal liability of directors. One of the reasons is that in the jurisprudence of the Philippines, there is no presumed liability of the directors if there's an error of the company. If director's liability is invoked or allegedly there is uh, wrongdoing of the directors by anyone then there has to be 
proof or it has to be specifically proven that this error was caused by the acts or not doing anything of that director. So we have already a relatively high hurdle there. And the second thing is, it has not just to be proven that the director acted willfully, gross negligently in bad five or in conflict of interest. It has to be also specifically proven by the person alleging the liability that the liability, the, lo uh, the losses faced, the damages are linked to that wrongdoing of the director. So the hurdles are relatively high in these regards. That's why in the Philippines we, or as I mentioned, I'm not aware of many cases um, for director's liability under this provision. There is, however, the possibility under many, many different laws and specific provisions of criminal or administrative liability of the members of the board of directors. So being a corporate officer by itself is not enough to hold the officer liable in the corporation's name if the corporation neglects its duties. However, there are a number of specific provisions of law making, making that may hold a particular office liable for the participation in a specific unlawful act. We will see such um, specific criminal liability or the most practical case is actually in social security laws. Social security laws um, state or uh, give the possibility that when the company does not correctly or not at all remit the social security um, payments for its employees, that not only the company, but also the directors can be held liable in this case. And that's one of the most practical applications. There are other, other criminal provisions, but actually the same applies. And also what we heard about Indonesia, as long as the director acted not in bad faith, um, not cross negligently, and well, criminal law, we could eventually have negligence. Um, the risk is, um, I would say, manageable or not um, of great significance. Let's go to the next topic. Now let's go to the next slide. So having learned about the risks um, for the directors, let's talk about the challenges the companies face in the Philippines with regards to compliance in general nowadays. That it can affect many things. I'm focusing more on the regulatory and the taxes, social security contributions, and so on. But as you will see, many of these uh, items mentioned here are also equally or to some extent might also affect your um, business operations or your, um, um, your delivery of, of goods, uh, services that you provide yourself. So the Philippines is and always has been a country which um, is ridden by bureaucracy, unfortunately, which is also the biggest challenge nowadays faced because bureaucracy in the Philippines is basically due to a lot of paper-based processes and a lot is based on personal contact. So going back to social security, for example, we have in the Philippines three social security agencies. Each agency has their own process about how to calculate, report and pay those social security contributions. In general, you have calculated, you um, report it online, then you have to go either to the agency itself or to the bank, make payment there or submit the reports, which, as you might imagine, was a challenge in the last weeks, particularly when there was a strict lockdown, or um, still is a challenge because now after the lockdown, many companies uh, are doing their payments at the same time. So we have long queues up to hours uh, at the agencies, at the banks, that you can make your payments, and most important, that you can make your payments in time. Second topic that affects it in the Philippines, uh, also affecting the operations, is transportation at the moment. As I mentioned, there was first, or uh, well, there is still no public transportation, uh, very little public transportation, therefore many companies still operate from home. Of course, uh, if you have to make physical reports, payments for your compliance matters, taxes, social security, and so on, that is a challenge that has to be overcome. 
positive thing is that um, more and more digital payment methods and so on come up. Um, question is number one, if it's working, number two, it needs time to be established for every company. Um, another challenge in the Philippines, uh, we have numerous regulatory changes. Accessibility of information is challenging and we have a fragmentation of regulations. So numerous regulatory changes, I think we have that in every country. We are doing uh, reporting for one of our clients every day. We compare that to the previous years. And the number of reports or regular changes that we have to report or report is about two to three times compared to the same time in the previous years. So that's, of course, a challenge for everyone in our business, but also a challenge for our clients to keep abreast, to keep on top of all this information that's blasted out at the moment. Um, accessibility of information. Um, Sometimes it is not clear that uh, regulations, advisory circulars, and so on need to be interpreted. But it has always been, and at the moment, it's still very challenging to get contact to the respective authorities in the Philippines. Um, if you don't have a specific contact, just by calling the hotline or and so on is very very difficult or you, or to get a reply uh, or get a reply in a um, relevant uh, in a to say a reasonable period. And then we have the fragmentation. The fragmentation, let, give me, let me give you an idea about, we have Metro Manila, which is the capital of the Philippines. And Metro Manila itself has 16 different cities. Each of these cities have this diff, has different regulations for how to deal with COVID. So for some employers, uh, it was sometimes a challenge. They did not know which of their employees can actually make it to the office and which ones can't make it to the office. Because in one of the barangays, there was still strict uh, lockdown, so they could not leave or there were checkpoints, so they could just leave under specific requirements. But for others, that was not a problem. For companies, I have heard in some areas of Metro Manila, you require to have a rapid test to open your business, in other parts not. And that's just for Metro Manila with 16 cities. Uh, total of the Philippines has about 40 to 45,000 barangays. So that's a huge challenge uh, for companies, also a challenge for us to deal not just with the amount of information, the challenge to clarify on the information, and we have lots of like a, a fragmentation of different rules. Uh, challenge, uh, another challenge is the backlog internal and external. Um, internal backlog is for companies what we see that shut down their operations during the enhanced community quarantine. Then 1st of June, after basically eight or 10 weeks, opened up and then on one go had to do basically all their government filings, had to do everything within a short period of time. And again, there's many, many or most of the companies who had to do it. So dealing with this backlog in still a difficult situation, um, challenges many of, of the clients. Um, we did actually a good decision in this regard. So for Rudel, we said, unless the client is not specifically instructing us, for example, to delay payment of taxes, which was possible during ECQ, we actually recommended to do continuous filings as per usual, knowing that at the later stage, there might be backlogs, but more also on the side, and that's the second topic of the government authority. Let's we talk just now about the internal challenges. Let's go to the government authorities. Let's take one of the social security agencies, uh, SSS, Social Security uh, Service. And they are having so many cases and filings and applications at the moment. While they are still actually having a reduced workforce on site, most people of the agency working at from home as well, that they limit the transactions to. 1,000 transactions per day for certain open um, offices. So I give you an example for um, one of our liaison officers. He went there on a Wednesday at 7 a.m. Office opens at 8 of SSS, and he was not able to make the cutoff of 1,000 at that time before the office even opened. He came back the following day on Thursday, Still didn't make the cutoff. 
our liaison officer came back on Friday, which was the last day that we could make the filing. Otherwise, potential penalties that would have been faced. Good thing in the Philippines, penalties are normally not of the greatest amount because the laws are relatively old. So therefore, also in relation thereto, the penalties are lower. But he queued there at 3.30 in the morning on a Friday. At 5.30, the cutoff was reached of thousand transactions when the office makes opens at 8 o'clock. This is just, and that's why I'm focusing a bit more or broader to give you an idea about the operations in the Philippines. This is just the practical challenges that you're facing with the calculation of the security, the social security, the payment, and so on. Yes, there's also operational challenges, but the overall quarantine environment, that's giving a lot of practical challenges on the compliance as well as your operations. Um, another challenge um, is the availability of resourceness or business operations. This is, as I mentioned, for example, with SSS, you have much longer queuing times. You need to spend more time in uh, figuring out what the new regulations are, what are the new deadlines and so on, which also takes additional resources, um, which uh, have to be actually somehow provided internally or externally. General compliance risks. Um, so what this, these challenges lead to for me, or what I'm saying nowadays is compliance is more important than ever in the Philippines. Before we could have argued that there were maybe companies which purposely were not compliant because you can calculate um, the risks involved. But nowadays compliance is more crucial than ever. And what are the reasons why I'm saying so? That's the right side. So number one, we have the general compliance risks. Or, um, one is to have tax audits or to have social security audits, which already existed, of course, before the COVID uh, crisis. Um, but we have seen that when the government required money for the famous build, build, build project, where the government invests heavily in infrastructure projects. So therefore, already before COVID, the government gave the tax officers relatively high tax targets and we saw an increase in tax audits and it's a speculation i hope that's not the case but um, i would say there's the risk that this might be the case very soon again as soon as the tax officers can get into the companies or can start to uh, with audits uh, for the companies um, something that's new and that's also why i'm saying compliance is more important than ever um, there have been some forms of government subsidies, but interestingly, and I think that has never been the case in the Philippines before, at least I'm not aware of, these subsidies are now linked to show that you're compliant with tax laws, that you're registered, that you have been tax compliant within the last three years, that the employer is uh, registered with the social security agencies and has been paying for the last three years social security contribution. So therefore, compliance is more crucial and more important than ever because only if the company, only if you're compliant, that might open you the door to some government subsidies or government support. Um, then last but not least, why is it more important than ever? Um, special liability. We talked about director's liability, um, which is, of course, non-payment of social security contributions but there's also a specific provision um, under the social security law which says if an employee um, gets COVID goes to the hospital and in that case actually there's SSS and PhilHealth which should pay for these costs but the employee is not able to get payment or support because of the failure of payment of the employer uh, the law says on advisory of the Department of Labor and Employee is that in that case, the employer has to come up for all the costs of the employee, which can be significant higher, of course, if the person is hospitalized and so on, than the relatively small uh, minor contributions uh, payable in the Philippines for social security contribution. Let's go to the next slide. We talked about the challenges. Let's have a quick uh, run through um, what can be done. So one topic is to provide sufficient resources, internal and external. So um, we see a lot of smaller companies which had like one accountant, uh, small, medium-sized business, 
um, they are facing challenges because if your accountant is either in the office busy with uh, figuring out the latest regulations or the other way stands in the queues uh, with the government authorities to file some reports, some work is not done. So it's important to provide uh, sufficient resources uh, internally or externally. Um, ensure business continuity. I think that's a very important point in the Philippines and to plan ahead for potential next lockdowns. We saw the numbers that the Philippines locked down with 110 uh, um, uh, cases. We are now at 47,000 cases. So it's not unlikely that uh, the curve never flattened in the Philippines that certain parts of the Philippines, your business, uh, even our business will be locked down. So it's uh, prudent for everyone to take uh, precaution. And I think uh, that's not just for the Philippines. Here it's maybe a bit more apparent because as I mentioned, the curve actually rather goes up instead that it flattens here. So we have to see what's happening in the next weeks. Um, but it's certainly prudent uh, for every business, not just on compliance, I think also for the operations to prepare for what's happening in the second wave. And also um, we can, nobody knows what's ahead, nobody can be really fully prepared, but we can learn already from the lessons learned from the past lockdown or from the past in our countries. Um, third number, what I suggest is do not delay reports and payments, uh, apply for renewals early. As I mentioned, um, if you have the opportunity financially, operationally with resources, um, just try to do business as usual. There is new challenges coming up and you want to avoid that ahead. Um, there is a big uh, pile of um, work reports, compliance matter piling up, which maybe cannot be handled after some time. Digitalize where possible to produce travel on personal contact. Uh, the positive thing which I see in the Philippines is I said bureaucracy was a big topic, but the government agencies which were struggling with digitalization for a long period of time now suddenly within weeks came up with solutions which were unthinkable before. So that's a really, really positive development in the Philippines and we hope that this development uh, continues. And uh, when these opportunities uh, uh, open up or when, when, when there's a possibilities coming up from the government authorities, use those uh, also with regards to the point that I just mentioned earlier in case we have a second wave coming up or so on. Proper documentation uh, with regards to compliance challenges. Um, I mentioned earlier the case with SSS. Uh, I mean, um, you can in the Philippines apply for an extension of deadlines, but normally you have to apply it in writing. Um, and practically you normally, or you will likely not get a reply until the deadline is passed. And even if it's passed, often it's still rejected because it would have no merit. So therefore you have the deadlines, you have to deal with those uh, deadlines. If you cannot meet them for specific reasons, as I said, the cut of times earlier or what happened for us a few times, luckily not of a penalty, but I do not know in the morning if the government agencies we are going to are still open. That's the first thing uh, we are checking actually in the morning, which ones have given an advisory in the last uh, 24 hours uh, since, since we closed the office um, if the government agency is open. So if it's not open, if you want to do a report online uh, via the online portal of uh, social security, the security agency and it's not accessible, which happened also several times in the past, document it that in case there is later discussion about penalties and so on, you have proof. And um, normally in the Philippines, that's also a positive thing. And I put it here in the middle. The act or the main law for dealing with the COVID crisis is called by Yan Yan, uh, heal as one act. And the positive thing is with all the challenges that we are facing, government authorities, people all coming together to heal as one. And there's a very positive spirit also when you talk with the government agencies to overcome problems that are faced. So that Let's get to go to the last three topics. Uh, review of regulatory compliance, arrangements make appropriate changes and circumstances change. I mean, that's, I think, common sense. Stay updated, stay flexible. Uh, flexibility has been in the Philippines always a big topic uh, now more than ever. Be contact to the regulator, regulators, uh, to the government officers early um, so that you can work if there's challenges faced 
and pointed out to them early. And as I mentioned, they're normally uh, at the moment uh, very open and very helpful then to address that practically. So um, that was my last slide. Um, so if there's any questions, um, I think I'm still within the time limit. So then let's please go ahead for the questions. Thanks, Marianne. You are well within the time limit. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting insight to the features in the Philippines. Yeah, uh, we have indeed received one question which refers to the COVID-19 situation, which you uh, just mentioned already. When do you expect the Philippines to end the current quarantine measures and to uh, transition to the new normal? Maybe you can give yeah. some yeah, we, aspects on this. We saw for her uh, earlier on the slide on, of Bettina, we can go back to the very first slide, uh, the different um, quarantine levels. Um, and currently, most um, most uh, parts of the Philippines are either under the general community quarantine or the modified general community quarantine, slowly opening up. Um, but as you see, the numbers are significant higher um, now what we add per day uh, than when we had the strict lockdown. So there are rumors, and I talked last week with um, someone of uh, cabinet rank um, that there is discussions uh, to go back actually to a lockdown, which uh, would be for challenging for companies. It would be very challenging for um, for the general economy as well. Um, and everybody's hoping we're not taking it. So the numbers are not looking uh, great. Um, but on the other side, this morning, the president, early morning today, he said uh, the Philippines has difficulties going back to this because there is no money. That's what he literally said. Uh, so um, I think Philippines, my personal assessment is we have to be careful um, if the cases and particularly uh, death cases go up, uh, there is a likelihood we're going back. Um, on the other hand, I say we will most likely stay for a pretty long time still under this uh, community quarantine and the restrictions on public transport that the offices can only run up to 50% and so on. And the new normal, uh, if we go to the school, uh, President Duterte said that uh, school will only resume when there is a vaccine. And I'm sure Philippines will be not the first country that will get that vaccine. Uh, they are also struggling with getting the tests at the moment. Philippines tests about 15,000 persons per day. Uh, so that's uh, very, very little if you compare that to, to other countries. And they have been trying to increase that to 30,000 over the last weeks and have difficulties to purchase the test kits. and the laboratory equipment and so on. So I guess we will be in the Philippines for this for a long time. I personally think until end of the year with a gradual and slight um, um, opening up or ease of the measures. The good thing is the Filipinos are very resilient. Um, they have dealt with earthquakes, they have dealt with typhoons, they have dealt with many, many difficult situations. So uh, your employees, I think the Filipinos in general, it's a difficult situation for everyone, but uh, we can cope with that. And as the government said, by heal together by Yanni Han, um, I think that's the spirit here. And even though it will take a long time, um, I think uh, Philippines still does quite okay. May the good spirit uh, keep on. Uh, thanks a lot for this assessment. Um, we will now hand over the digital floor to Dr. Paul Weingarten, who will elaborate on the situation in Singapore. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Markus. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning for those who log in from Germany. Um, corporate compliance is always important and even more so during these uh, COVID times. I would like to focus today on four key areas that are actually of in particular interest for managers and uh, directors. You may look into the next slide. We see, um, Bettina, please, the next slide. Yeah. So these four areas are cash flow management, um, contractual duties and obligations, and also liabilities that come with it, health and safety at workplace and for your employees, and 
HR related topics, employment law. Um, we will first look at the legal framework. So, as you know, that um, Singapore has actually enacted a lot of new regulations, amended laws um, to deal with this COVID-19 situation and also to help businesses to manage their cash flow and to support local workforce. Um, those in Singapore are very familiar with these schemes, most of it the job support scheme, um, hiring incentive and so on. Basically, you didn't even need to apply for these schemes and the government would subsidize or reimburse you part of the salaries of your local workforce. Altogether, Singapore has issued three supplementary budgets and uh, it is an amount of more than 90 billion Singapore dollars that the government is investing, partly from the reserves, to actually help Singapore businesses. So, all these new regulations need to be carefully monitored, of course. But I would like to give you an overview on the legal framework, and I don't mean only legislation, I also mean other legal framework um, that you need to respect when you look into these four key areas that should be of your focus as managers. So when we talk about cash flow management or when we talk about cash flow measures, we would also need to look into the corporate statutes, into the constitution of the company, into the company's act. There may not be so many specific COVID-related new amendments, but any cash flow measure you take, you need to be in compliance. You probably, like Mark was already elaborated, um, you probably need to seek the consent of shareholders or of uh, maybe an advisory board to, for example, um, pay out dividends or take, take up a loan. Um, there's one topic that is always of great interest, of course, it is um, the potential of running into insolvency. Here, there was a recent amendment, there's a bit of a relief granted that the thresholds for insolvency are increased and used to be $10,000 and it's now $100,000. And instead of the 21 days uh, statutory um, period to respond to demands, it is now six months. I will come to that later as well, but um, this gives a little bit more lean way to companies not to be considered insolvent so soon and so strict. Let's look into contracts. You probably um, owe suppliers money. You may um, be obliged to perform a contract that you can't perform at the moment due to COVID-related constraints in workforce, in um, your own supply chain, contractors, and so on. And you're probably a tenant for your office space or for your warehouse, and you need to pay your rent. Again, the government acted here quite quickly, and the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act provides relief for certain obligations, for certain type of contracts, for a period of six months. So, for example, in the construction industry, if you have a construction and supply contract and you're not able to perform this contract due to COVID, is of course, is always the tricky point, right? You have to um, prove that the inability to perform your duties is indeed caused by COVID. But then you can come under the umbrella of this COVID-19 Act and it means that you are not in breach of the contract, you are not responsible or liable for damages, and your customer cannot call any performance bonds or start insolvency proceedings against you. So there's a bit of a protection, provided that you can prove it is really connected to COVID, and you must also serve a notification for relief to your customer. Of course, it is important to note the obligations are not um, gone, the obligations are not uh, permanently um, yeah, done away with, but they are only waived for this six-month period. So currently the period ends of, at 19th of October 2020, and then you would still need to perform your contract. In case of a dispute, because you may think you fall under the ambit of this um, COVID-19 Act and your non-performance is due to COVID, your customer may not accept this. In case of a dispute, there is an assessor from the Ministry of Law who could take a decision and the decision is final. 
he would probably then um, rule in a determination that uh, some contractual um, obligations are postponed. In general, Singapore encourages um, companies in business relations with issues to perform their obligations, to talk to each other and to find an amicable way to settle. Um, as you know, Singapore has even a new um, mediation center, an international mediation center, and um, there are ways to, to deal with the situations before you really end up in a court case. And many courts, in many cases, the courts would actually at the moment not hear your case because they would probably assess that you're covered under one of the um, protections under the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act. Other types of contracts, I just mentioned the uh, construction industry, uh, construction and supply contracts. Other terms of contracts would be a high end purchase agreement for plant and machinery. So in this case, the seller would not be able to take repossession of the plant or of the machinery. And again, they could not start insolvency proceedings against you. There is also a protection for commercial lease agreements, not for private lease agreements, but commercial lease agreements. Um, if you cannot pay your rent, again, due to COVID and you fall under the bit of the COVID-19 Temporary Measures Act, then your landlord would not be able to terminate the lease agreement or evict you from the premises. Further relief is granted to the tourism industry, so for food and beverage uh, catering contracts and to SMEs for unsecured loans. You may have heard there was a lot of discussion probably um, in many countries, I will bring it up here because I find it also relates to the legal framework you need to consider in these four key areas. You may have heard a lot about the discussion whether a force majeure clause that you may find in your contract could be triggered. Um, indeed, it depends a lot on how the force majeure clause is worded already. I think um, here in the common law environment, we, we stick a lot to the wording. And um, there are some suggestions that, yeah, it would be very good if the word pandemic or epidemic is at least uh, clearly mentioned. And then, of course, again, the challenge would be to establish the casualty so that the non-performance is really caused by um, this force majeure event that is mentioned in your force majeure clause. The consequences would, again, depend on the wording. It could be a uh, partly um, a right to renegotiate re re the contract or to maybe partly or in total suspend uh, the performance of the contract. Again, of course, um, there could be a um, du duty to mitigate the effects and it could have notification obligations. So um, I come to this maybe in the, in the next slide then when we look on how the managers should actually deal with these four challenges. But from the legal environment, we are now at the legal framework. I just want to highlight that it is not always so clear whether these force majeure clauses would apply or not, but there is a lot of discussion now due to this pandemic, COVID-19. Another doctrine that could be applicable is the doctrine of frustration. This is, again, not a specific event that you have foreseen in your contract, but it is actually an unspecific event, something you could not foresee when entering into this contract, which makes the um, performance of the contract impossible. Of course, there's a fine line what is impossible and what is just difficult. So again, here you would need to clearly demonstrate and prove that it is absolutely objectively impossible to perform this contract. Could be difficult. And last but not least, I would like to briefly mention the uh, investment protection agreement. Singapore has a vast network of investment protection agreements. This would or could be applicable if the government took any measures to handle the COVID crisis, which would be regarded as protagonist, which would affect you, discriminate you, um, which would be arbitrary or disproportionate. So, for example, to order a factory to produce certain goods or to take possession of certain private property. Again, in such a scenario, COVID-19 crisis, normally the government have quite some flexibility in how to tackle such a crisis. And it could be very difficult for you to establish really that this measure was arbitrary or discriminatory. And the government could probably um, always rely on the necessity exemption that it would have been absolutely necessary to take this measure or um, a higher 
uh, need actually, which is the safety of the population, interest of the state as such. So it could be very difficult. Another area is health and safety. Those in Singapore are probably very familiar with all the many regulations that have been enacted on stacked working hours, on safe distance rules, safe entry, which is an application that is linked to the government where we are supposed to register whenever we enter any premises, a shopping mall, a restaurant, but also an office, also a workplace, a warehouse, whatever it is. And um, I've just listed here on the slide a few authorities that are good to look at and, and maybe look regularly at the websites. It's the Ministry of Health, the Ministry of Manpower, the BCA, Building and Construction Authority, and the ITA, the Immigration Authority of Singapore. So most of the new developments are published actually on the Ministry of Health website. They sort of act here as a joint task force, and um, I think it is very good to monitor this. I don't want to go into details. Most of you are hopefully very familiar with this, at least those in Singapore. The government websites are pretty clear and good in general. Um, coming to HR, if we look again at the legal framework, COVID-related, we have the Tripartite Advisory on Managing Excess Manpower and Responsible um, Retrenchment, which actually is a guideline to it's a guideline for you when you have to take HR-related measures like cost-cutting measures or um, even um, redundancy of workforce. And the aim is, of course, to make this transparent and fair. It is only a guideline, but you can assume that the courts in Singapore would very much take this as a basis for any decision in court. So far, we've not seen any court decision. Um, in, in, in case of any disputes, you can always, or employees would always be able to make a report to the MOM, which is already something that is um, to be avoided for, for companies. So I think, yeah, you're well advised to monitor here the legal development and to also be in accordance with these uh, tripartite advisory managing excess manpower guidelines. Another area where we see a lot of uh, new development and basically almost uh, yeah, daily or weekly amendments to the, to the regulations is visa and immigration. Um, SHN, stay home notice, is a word that is used basically for quarantine in Singapore. So if you enter Singapore, first you need an approval and then you need to place yourself into quarantine, into the stay home notice for 14 days. And the stay home notice for most um, persons who enter Singapore has to be served in a government facility. And just very recently, about two weeks ago, roughly, Germany managed as the only country in Europe to be included in a list of countries, mostly here in the region, Australia, New Zealand, um, Japan, Korea. Um, if you come from these countries, you can actually stay home and do the stay home notice or serve the stay home notice in your own residency and not in the government facilities which is of course not only more convenient, but also much more cost effective as you have to pay for the government facilities or your employer. Um, so there's a lot of changes, even small changes that are not broadly announced. It is uh, well advisable to monitor this very carefully if you consider traveling. And I think many businesses in Singapore regard it as essential to travel in the region and they're only waiting for the doors to open again um, there's also a corridor with six provinces in China where you can have a, a certain path that you apply and then you can travel to China and back, not, not to any third countries, right, um, for business, for essential business travels. There's also new conditions under the Employment of Foreign Manpower Act, mainly applying to foreign workers. Um, there was a lot in the media, all the issues Singapore has with foreign workers. We have now a quite vast set of regulations and the responsibilities for uh, companies as employers are quite detailed. You need to make sure that your foreign worker does not take public transport and uh, you need to have a lot of um, issues to be taken care of. Again, I think I cannot go into details and it will also change very, very quickly. So be up to date here. That is about the legal framework when it comes to compliance related to COVID. And in my next slide, I would like to show or to look at these four aspects from a director's point of view, from a manager point of view. So 
how do you best deal with these four areas that you should have an eye on? Maybe to start with the general duties and liabilities of a director, um, Marian has already, I think, uh, elaborated on this. Um, there is no change in the, in, the, in, the, in the doctrine as such, right? A director has to act honestly in the best interest of the company, um, diligently, and uh, has to apply certain skills and care when he exercises his duties. So um, all this has not really changed. But since some of the uh, regulations have changed, since the legal framework is changing very quickly, the directors are well advised to also take this into account. And for example, we look as a first uh, pillar, as a first topic into, again, the cash flow management. You may need to take actions like pay out dividends or maybe take, take up a loan. Um, here again, you need to respect, of course, not only the statutory requirements within your company, you may need to get some approvals from shareholders or even maybe you have an advisory board that needs to consent, but also you have to act in the best interest of the company. So in COVID times, I think you are well advised to well document the basis for your decisions here. Some laws provide a specific liability for the directors. For example, the CPF, the Central Provident Fund, um, you have to make contributions for your employees and also as an employer, and the director is personally liable for any act or omission that is in breach of the CPF board's regulations. Um, Another duty of the directors is the statutory reporting. There's, of course, a lot of duties provided in the Companies Act, and fortunately, you probably have your company secretary taking care of most of them. But um, there's one COVID-related specific uh, amendment. You have an obligation to hold an AGM once a year and file your annual return. Here, currently, we have an automatic extension of the deadline of 60 days. So if the AGM was due from May to August, it is automatically extended for 60 days. And the authorities will probably look into this even beyond the date to find some, some arrangements. If you look at your other statutory reporting obligations, for example, to keep books and to file a financial statement at the end of the year, here, normally the financial statement you have now covers the year 2019, right? So all the COVID-related aspects of maybe a necessary re-evaluation of your assets, maybe write down certain assets, would probably not uh, be of, of, of any uh, implication here to your financial statements. But um, if your company is in a really disastrous financial position and you sign the financial statements as a director now and you file them now, then you may need to be careful because in the financial statements, you indirectly always uh, declare like a, a very um, small uh, solvency statement, right? You say that the company is able to pay its debts when they are due. So again, you need to exercise this with uh, due care. And you may need to get support when it comes to a re-evaluation of your assets and the possible adjustments, which need to be done then, of course, in the 2020 financial statements or at an earlier date if you have reporting, internal reporting requirements. Insolvency, I've mentioned it already, I'm often asked by clients, is there an um, obligation to file for insolvency proceedings, like what we know in Germany, if certain, if certain parameters are met, you have to file for insolvency. Well, uh, in Singapore, this is not really the case. It's not so clear, but the director has to act in the interest of the company and respect the interests of the creditors as well. So the more difficult the financial situation of your company becomes, the more you have to emphasize on the interests of your creditors over the interest of your shareholders. If you fail to account for the creditors' interests, you're personally liable for the debt and also face criminal proceedings. Again, here, there is a slight amendment due to the COVID-19 um, situation. I've already talked about the increase of thresholds for insolvency, but also for the directors and their duty and liability we have here a, a relief that a director may continue business activity, even in the case of an insolvency situation, uh, as long as the debt is occurred in the company's ordinary course of business. So again, it's a bit of more leeway. Well, 
Coming to the next point, contracts. It is extremely important that you know your contracts. You need to assess whether there's any guarantees, penalties that impose a risk. Again, it boils in the end down to a financial risk, which you need to include, of course, in your projections of the financial situation of the company. But also, how do you deal with difficulties to perform a contract? You should have a contract management system in place and not leave the communication entirely maybe to your sales team or to your procurement team. And you should keep records, right? According to the Electronic Transactions Act, electronic records are fine. But do keep records, do pay attention to the communication. Um, I think with regards to the time, I will not go into great detail here. Uh, I just think to highlight to you that this is also a responsibility of the director because according to your fiduciary duties, you need to act in the interest of the company, always. Health and safety. We have heard there's a whole set of regulations. Most important for directors is to implement a system of safe management measures. And this is not just a piece of paper, a policy that you draft and, and, and put somewhere, but you really need to make sure it is implemented. That means it is also um, lived by your employees. You need to have a monetary system in place and you will appoint a safe management officer who is actually in charge of this. Again, there are fines stipulated, and um, you can imagine that probably um, this will be um, enforced by the authorities quite strictly. Coming to HR, there are some topics related to home office that are often uh, a big question mark. Um, cybersecurity, for example. In the office, you may have your, your IT setup. At home, maybe not always. Data protection. Is, are you in compliance or are your employees in home office in compliance of the obligation to keep data confidential, to delete data, to keep track record of personal data that you use? And last but not least, work health safety. So the regulation on the Work Safety and Health Act actually says that it is per se not applicable for home offices. However, the Work Injury Compensation Act is applicable to home offices. So again, check whether it is covered. You may need to check your insurance as well and um, make sure you're in compliance here. It is ultimately the director's responsibility. When it comes to foreign workers, I have already mentioned, I want to maybe highlight here only that if a foreigner who is employed by you wants to return to Singapore, you as the employer need to um, actually demand the companies or need to make a, a, an application for the approval for that foreigner to be able to return back to Singapore if he's on any work pass. In the beginning of this crisis, a few foreigners returned without approval and they were immediately at the immigration or very shortly after went back home and the company was deprived from its work pass privileges so they could not hire foreigners anymore. So the, 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 the enforcement is really quite strict and the, all these uh, new regulations when it comes to health safety, but also, of course, any immigration related constraints, they leave a lot of discretion to the authorities on how to enforce it. So even though in general, like Marion said, like uh, I said before, a company's liability is not really immediately a director's personal liability, but if the director or if this offense can be linked to an act or omission in breach of the director's duties, then the director can be very quickly liable. And all these um, safe management measures are addressed equally to the company, to its representatives, its directors, its agents, and to the employees. So all of them are potentially liable, right? So that is to, to keep in mind um, with these quite strict regulations. What can you do to limit your liability? The last slide already. Um, yeah. Um, of course, stay up to date and get expertise support when needed. For example, for the evaluation of some assets due to these very difficult economic terms or any HR related matters where you want to be in compliance. Um, implement the business continuity plan. This is a plan where you foresee certain scenarios and how you will deal with this. You will probably group employees in essential, non-essential, and you, you have, of course, your staff working hours, but maybe also team A, team B, and so on. So you foresee, again, 
further lockdowns, closures, temporary constraints in exercising the, um, the, 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 the duty. Um, you have policies in place, SOPs, standard office proceedings, and you monitor these and you update them regularly. This brings me to the most important, you have to document your accountability. It is not enough just to have a policy in place. You need to be able to show as a director, as a manager, that you also take care of the implementation, that you monitor the um, compliance with your policies, that you regularly update them, and all this you should be able to demonstrate so that finally you can show your accountability, your accountability for the compliance with all these regulations. Last but not least, you may look into a E&O insurance. So with regard to the time, I think I will not elaborate this further. I think we have seen that there is really a fair bit of new legislation. It can be difficult to cope with the pace of legislation that is passed. And the director's liabilities could in a way have increased due to a stricter and probably an enforcement that leaves a bit more discretion to the authorities. And in particular, when it comes to the health, safety, immigration, to all this really COVID-related part, I think so far we have seen very strict and stringent enforcement in Singapore. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, uh, for these insights. Yeah, we are stretching our time frame a little bit now, but uh, there were some Q&A popping up and I, yeah, let's allow ourselves uh, a few more minutes to address at least one or two of these, um, because I assume this might be of interest for some of our audience. Um, so let me take this one. I am a director of our company in Singapore. If I appoint a safety officer, wouldn't he be liable for all safety measures and not me? Yeah, I think that's what I, I try to explain that actually um, uh, the, all these safety management measures are addressed not only to the company, to its management and also to the employees. So I think if there is a breach, the authorities would look into the case. Is the employee in breach, the employee is liable? Of course, you can always say as a manager, I put certain mechanisms in place, right? I have uh, assigned this task to someone, um, but it does not ultimately uh, free you from any potential liability uh, if any offense can be actually linked to an act or omission on your side. So, of course, if we have totally nothing in place, no policies, no safety manager, um, then it is very clear that you're liable, right? Um, but depending on the offense, I think uh, you cannot totally rely on delegating these uh, necessary uh, tasks and um, duties to, to your staff or to other managers in your team. Hmm. Thanks. Um, here's one more. Um, we are not so much hit by the crisis. And thanks to the job support scheme, etc., our financials are good. My headquarter asked me to send money back to Germany. You mentioned that directors have to act in the interest of the company. So can I do that? Hmm, that's, that, that could be a tricky question. I mean, in general, um, okay, when you send money back to your headquarters, uh, you would probably have a, a legal basis for that, right? You have an intercompany agreement, you have any services that your headquarter does. Uh, or it could be an interim dividend distribution. So you need to have a, a legal grounds for this, right? I would be very reluctant, in particular in these times now, to um, sign any new intercompany agreement for services that I can probably not even justify the price of or anything like this. Everything should be always arm's length, of course. So again, your duty to act in the interest of the company has priority. Um, secondly, of course, there is a probably a framework of your company statutes again like your your constitution you need a shareholders approval and so on and um you you may note that the directors the board of directors are meant to be independent so from the company's act um on the concept of the company's act shareholders cannot give a direction to directors to do something so if you feel that it is not the right way to send money back in whatever way you would need to do this um you can certainly make a point here and document why why you have a different view. Um, 
I think you mentioned the job support scheme. I mean, this could maybe be in particular mm -hmm. tricky. And I think a lot of, in particular, also German companies are discussing what do they do if they don't really need the funds. It's public funds that are meant to support the Singapore workforce. So if you use these public funds to pay dividends now, that could be a bit tricky or at least questionable, right? Um, so it is, it is a tricky question indeed that I think would need to be looked into the details of the grounds. Why would you need to send money back to the headquarters? Sure. One quick one to the end uh, with regard to our, yeah, overwhelming topic, uh, COVID-19. Um, can I force my staff to download the Trace Together app? <laughs> okay. Right, that, that is quite easy to answer. And uh, the, 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 there's so. no obligation, uh, maybe to say no obligation yet to use the Trace Together app. So you are, of course, um, encouraged to also strongly encourage your staff to use this app. But uh, it is not yet, as I say, an obligation to use this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, thanks a lot uh, for taking these questions. Thanks a lot to all the audience for joining us in this webinar today. And of course, to my co-speakers uh, for presenting on their jurisdictions uh, today. I will now uh, give the floor back to Bettina for some closing remarks and remain with a warm thank you to all for joining us today. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Marcus, and thank you all of my colleagues for elaborating on the specific situations in your different countries. Um, thank you all to the audience for attending today's webinar, and I hope you took some helpful insights with you. Um, should any questions have been left unanswered due to time issues, please do not hesitate to just drop me an email and let me know because uh, we will answer each and every one of your questions for sure. Um, as always, I will be happy to share the slides uh, of today's webinar with you upon request. Just let me know and I will be happy to let you have the slides. Well, once again, thank you all and have a great day and stay safe. Bye.